case we hadn't met. Um, I'm one of the younger researchers on the third floor. Uh, I'm on the third floor, and I seem to be one of the many young researchers on that floor, so come say hi. I'm a PhD student at the University of Colorado in Boulder's Environmental Studies program, but I do all my research here at GIFS. Today I'm going to talk to you about the work I've been doing for the past two years, which the title of my talk is, Will the Best Wharf Please Identify Itself? Choosing the Best Wharf Configuration for Precipitation and Circulation Simulations Over West Africa. And by this, I mean the challenge of trying to tune the numerical model to a region, a model that has the potential to be used for regional climate modeling applications. And I'm not going to talk to you just about the evaluation of one, but many model downscaling si simulations over West Africa. So the goals of my talk are just to introduce the WARF model, to introduce WARF simulations of daily variability over West Africa, and just discuss this work as a first step towards using WARF as a regional climate model, and hopefully a discussion about the utility of the model for those purposes. <coughs> now, my thesis work in evaluating WARF for West African simulations, and I'm assessing a couple aspects of model performance to reproduce daily variability of the West African monsoon features, to determine an optimal set of physics for monthly to interseasonal time scales. And by doing this, I'm also benchmarking the WARF results to another RCM to this region. Uh, yes, first I'd like to also give credit to um, my collaborators. I'm working with Dr. Len Drian and Dr. Matthew Pulakiza, who also do regional climate modeling work with an in-house Reason to climate model here at GIS, which I'll get to, and which I'm benchmarking my work to. Okay, so first, what is the WARF? It's a model that many of us may have heard, but I'll go ahead and reintroduce you to it. It's the National Center for Atmospheric Weather and Research Forecasting Model, which was and is developed primarily as a mesoscale forecast model and data assimilation system for shorter range simulations. But it's a community model, which means that anyone can use it and change it at their will. And they, on their website, basically, they're claiming approximately 7,000 research users and 22 operational centers in 95 countries use it. It's a popular model used throughout the world. Uh, some of the more known centers here in the US, the NSEP, and also the US Air Force use it operationally. Now, just a little anecdote, I'd like to introduce you how uh, the WARF model found me. I went to Penn State for uh, BS in meteorology, and I became interested in the WARF model when I started doing multi-summer internships at NCAR, where I was assisting on global climate modeling projects. I was always interested in how to bring the global work down to the regional scale. But while I was working there, I always kept hearing, because it wasn't out yet, I always kept hearing about the next big model in development at the micro, mesoscale micrometeorology division at NCAR, the WARF. Later on, when I went to grad school, I also got a job because I needed to work while I was in grad school, and I got a job at a hurricane reinsurance company. It was very interesting when I was there because I was also there when Katrina hit. But many of the modeling methods they used there are, were pretty private, but during the downtime, we always kept referring to this one very cool model that seemed to get hurricane tracks right, and it was free. And it was the early version of the wharf at that time that people could just download off the website. And I got interested in it when I started noticing that hurricane tracks would get right when the model would spin or run simulations longer than seven days. And so that just perked my interest in it. I started during my off time, well, I started learning about it and playing with it, which was completely unrelated to my master's degree in science policy. But once, once uh, I had set it up, done some configurations with it, started forecasting over the US, 
I decided to take the war to the next level and look at original climate modeling, which is how I wound up here. And so when I first got here, I was very ambitious. I wanted to take the warp and start churning out 20 or 10 year to 20 year, 30 year simulations. But thankfully I was guided uh, by Len here to start back, start from the ground up to vetting the model on shorter time scales. And I'm glad I did because questions are being raised now as to whether this model can be used over West Africa. But real quick, there are several versions of the wharf. There's the research version, which is called the Advanced Research Version of WARF, pretty original, the WARF ARW. Then they have the hurricane model, which they call HWARF, which is the one that I first became introduced to. They have a wired wildfire model, or fire. And then the operational version used by NSEP and NOAA is called the non-hydrostatic mesoscale model, WARF NMM, which supposedly they might be phasing out. But then, is there a regional climate modeling version? Now, I've looked through the literature. People use WARF in regional climate mode, meaning they extended up simulations 10 years, 20 years. But in 2009, NCAR itself, they are doing a blending of the WARF ARW with the NCAR community climate system, which they're calling the nested regional climate model. And just a little, if you can see this. Jim Burrell, in a briefing to the Western Governors Association, they're saying that this nested regional climate model is an ambitious and strategic goal to combine the WARF and CCSM models into a nested regional climate model that will allow for fundamental progress on understanding and prediction of regional climate variability and change. Okay, but this nested regional climate model, it's not available, it's not downloadable. It's, it's basically a project they're working on. So, if you want to use the WARF for regional climate modeling applications, you basically just download the version that everyone else has access to, which is the WARF ARW, which is what I'm using. So my setup, my modeling domain, it's over West Africa. This is the actual model domain. And my region of focus is the Sahel. But when I actually run the simulation, it's this whole semi, it's this whole domain. And it's a 20 by 20 kilometer, kilometer horizontal grid resolution. And then there are 30 variably spaced signal layers. I use a two minute time step, six hour link diagnostics as model output. And the initial conditions, I drive the model with an NRP2, reanalysis 2. And in my simulations, I don't use any nudging of conventional or spectral in the domain interior and the nesting. But, okay, so why West Africa? First, West Africa has a monsoon climate, and this video shows it's an animation of the total monthly rainfall in millimeters as recorded by Trim. And basically, you can see uh, the months here as it spins during, basically from the spring to the summer, you can see that the rain band moves up over the West African region. And this is basically the only, this is the summer, and this is the only time when the rains come to the region. So this is just a nice video just to show it has a monsoon climate. And the dry season occurs during October and April, which is not a drought. But West African monsoon variability does have implications. Uh, in fact, droughts in this region some of the longest in the 20s, some of the longest signals in the 20th century have been associated with late onsets to the West African monsoon over a period of time. And also, West, variability in the West African monsoon extremes <coughs> can also result in flooding. But this region is very sensitive to variability because it's also a very agriculturally dependent region. Variability in the West African monsoon also impacts the US. This is just a small example uh, these are daily accumulated precipitation plots of tropical storms that eventually became hurricanes all during 2005, coming off the west coast of Africa. Uh, Bonnie, Charlie, Francis, Ivan, and later on towards summer 2006, 
Hurricane Katrina. Yep. Can I just ask about the flooding? Is it, is the, does the flooding occur because of severe rainfall, or is it in part because of extended monsoon period? Or just, I mean, can you have rain that's just going on for longer periods of time, and then it goes into rivers and eventually floods downstream? Or is it really because of severe and total amount of rainfall? I think it's a combination of both, but uh, just from what I read, during long periods of drought, you have lots of topsoil loose, and then you have rains that come all of a sudden. Well, it's societies there are really prepared for that. Now, the time period that I actually that I use for this these simulations. It's during September 2006, which is also coincides with the after monsoon multidisciplinary analysis campaign. So instead of just deciding to pick any year or just start churning out the simulations, I chose a period where data is actually available. Uh, sorry to read see this writing, but uh, during the African multidisciplinary analysis, on a, many scientists went to Africa. There was a field campaign in which they took radio signs, set up stations um, all throughout West Africa in the car. They had radio sign, drop sign observations, a plethora of information available. That all occurred during the summer of 2006. There are also longer, there are, also, there are three observing periods to the um, one in which they start from 2002 to 2010, just collecting station data that's already in place or repairing stations that are there. The advanced observing period, which is a, a five-year period designed to, it's a document climate transect for several flights over the region. But what I'm focusing on is the actual field campaign, which occurred in 2006, and which doc which occurred during the phases of when the monsoon actually occurred over West Africa, during May through June, when the West African monsoon onset occurred, during the peak season, and during the late monsoon season, which is my period of study. So I'm basically vetting the model to this time period. And also this work is relevant to NASA. This slide just shows that during AMA, uh, the US contributions to the AMA program for all these institutions, but NASA specifically helped with ground-based and flight-based op operations over the Atlantic and over the Dakar region, and setting up uh, radar sites all throughout West Africa and up near the Sahara. So the observational data sets that I use in my work, uh, I look at, I compare the work to satellite estimate, uh, rainfall estimation products, and also reanalysis. Products I look at are TRIM, CMORPH, Persian, well actually just those three. And this is just a total, a plot of total rainfall from the two week period that I'm looking at, September 2nd through September 13th. Uh, Basically, all three of the, these rainfall estimation products are on the same grid, but and here are the respective centers where they're from. But this plot just shows that even though you may have three sets of truth, uh, the information uh, could vary. Whereas trim shows that over the Guinea Highlands, there's a lot of precipitation that occurred, as well as off to the Atlantic. Whereas you have Persian saying that tons of precipitation occurred over Central Africa, which disagrees with these two uh, rainfall estimation products. So when I use these products, I also <coughs> look at FUSE. This basically just gives an indication that you know some, some observations match up, some don't. So depending on what you look at, you're going to get, there's going to be some uncertainty in your results. I also compare my results to NCAR reanalysis too. 
or NNRP, and also NASA's uh, recently available reanalysis data set, the MERA. And the, uh, the variables I'm looking at from the MERA are meridional wind, wind, or meridional wind and relative participant, so circulation. Now, I'm also benchmarking the wharf to the RCM here at NASA, which is the NASA GIS Regional Model Version 3. And this paper came out in 2009, which where Dr. Drian and Pulakiza updated the regional model from an 18 layer model to a 28 layer model. And this picture just shows a cross section of both models compared to NCAR reanalysis, which shows just the basically from the equator, well, the south end of Africa towards the north across the zero transect. The actinicially jet, and it appears in both models, and the 28 layer model seems to get it better. But this model has been tuned to West Africa. So when I started my simulations, I had to start somewhere instead of just starting in a black box or just alone. <coughs> and all precipitation results presented for the daily accumulation. Well, I'm only looking at daily accumulation from each model experiment. All circulation results presented are for zero Z, the instantaneous from each model experiment. And I calculate domain-wide statistics for the Sahel region only, the region that was in the red box. And I'm looking at correlation, standard deviation, root mean squared error, bias, and again, just precipitation, meridional wind, and relative vorticity. So the West, just real quick to familiarize you with West African monsoon components, here's a cross section of the September 2006 period that I'm looking at, but this is for the whole month. This shows that westerlies in the region, as they reverse with height, the, they start going, turning into easterly winds, and where the main concentration is around 600 millibars, which is the African easterly jet which is just one component of the West African monsoon system. You have the tropical easterly jet up here. You have, well, the component I'm concerned with are the African easterly waves that occur on three to five day, seven day time scales that organize, help organize convective systems that occur throughout this region. And some eventually turn into cyclones. But after initially waves, they occur, they can be seen as a meridional wind component that travels west, westward across West Africa at the region of about 700 millibars. That's the signal. And, all right, this might be a painful plot, but I'll get you through it. This, is, this shows African easterly waves over West Africa, and they're streamlines, basically U and V taking the stream function and plotting it from Mera at 700 millibars from September 2nd through September 7th. So this just shows daily snapshots of the streamlines uh, at that level. And all that I, the, the thing to use, see this, to use it for is that the streamlines give you a good idea of the tr troughs and ridges of at 700 millibars, which allow you to see African easterly waves. So for instance, here's a trough here that slowly moves off the coast of West Africa. Others form, for instance, we have an African easterly wave here and here. And this just goes on to, to show that during the 12 day time period that I'm looking at, these African easterly waves slowly move through the region and form areas, well, close lows off the coast all the way from September 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th. And if you look at the same variable at 925 millibars, the streamlines actually give an indication of closed lows moving off the coast. And the areas of white that you see here, that's topography in the model that's not allowing these streamlines to continue 
But the reason why I show this is that this one African easterly wave that moved off the coast, this one low, ended up turning into Hurricane Helene. Uh, on September 12th, it became a named tropical depression uh, south of Cape Verde Islands, and by September 17th, moved in the Atlantic and made its way towards uh, North America. Didn't hit it, but it slowly moved off in the Atlantic. So some African easterly waves help organize tropical disturbances off the coast of West Africa. Now those painful streamlines, an easier way to look at the waves is to do a Hubmuller plot. So Hubmuller plots are useful for looking at wave movement. On the x-axis, this is longitude down here. And on the y-axis, this is elapsed time. So for here, a snapshot at 0z, this shows daily precipitation, but showing it as yeah, daily precipitation. So this plot shows V700, or meridional wind at 700 millibars, only for this region. So all values are averaged between 5 north and 15 north latitude. And longitude is shown on the x-axis. And basically, you can start from day 1 all the way going to day 12, which shows slowly that waves move westward over the region. Now, these contours show areas of maximum meridional wind and then areas of, of negative meridional wind. Basically, southerly and northerly. Southerly and northerly. And this area would indicate a ridge, and where you have the southerlies turning, yes, where you have this area would indicate a trough. So, in, in just one sense, the hub mullers allow you to see the wave activity much more easily than stream, streamlines. And 95% of precipitation events are due to convective systems isolated and organized in African easterly waves. So. This is an, this plot, this Hubmuller plot of daily accumulated precipitation allows you to see that precipitation moves in wave-like activity across the region. Whereas this area of maximum daily precipitation, that's where the actual tropical storm was named, moved off the coast. Where you have meridional wind at 700 millibars showing wave activity. Another variable we'll look at is relative vorticity, which is the measure of cyclonic activity. Uh, in this plot, I actually just plot the meridional component only, which is dv dx. So it's just showing the cyclonic westward movement over time. And the axis of the waves actually well, it's easier to see here. The axis of the waves coincide with the troughs of the meridional wind, waves of meridional wind that move across the region. And just real quick, this is just a comparison of MERA versus NMRP. It pretty much shows the same activity. Except in it, so, reanalysis 2, it's available on a 2.5 degree grid, <coughs> whereas MERA is available on a a half degree by uh, 0.75 degree grid. And it, but basically, it shows the same behavior in, within the reanalysis, except a few differences. Same with the vorticity. Uh, it shows basically four African easterly waves that moved across the region during this time scale. So my, my goal is, can the wharf catch this? And this is just to show that at any given moment, uh, when convection is occurring, it occurs in waves across the region. This just shows September 10th, which would basically be this uh, this slice right here, which shows one, two, three. Well, it catches three shows here three areas of <coughs> maximum precipitation, which co might coincide with the convection that you see here. But the point of this picture is to show that convection occurs in waves. So I should
showed you one hub molar plot of trend, daily accumulated precipitation. This is also showing <coughs> Seymour and Persian, which basically also shows that they have the same activity. Granted, there's a few areas where they may differ, but the maximums all occur in the same plot space area. Slide. And this hub molar plot is of the NASA original model three. And it shows that during the first five days of there are minimums, it doesn't seem to catch maximums too well, but by the seventh day, although it looks broad, the maximums, just look at the areas where the maximums are in the right spot that seem to match up <coughs> with observations. So throughout the rest of the analysis, since these three pretty much match up, I just refer to the trim. So Eric, on this RM3, when did you initiate that run in comparison to the was it initiated on that bottom day? Yes. <coughs> it's initiated, so... so it, was, it was the same, the same run as what he did with the wolf. Right. Same day, same, same forcing data. Same forcing data, except the RM3 is run at a half degree grid, and I'm running a warp at a 20 kilometer by 20 kilometer grid. But they're ran, they were ran, run in the same way. So it, yes, it started, it's initialized on September 2nd went all the way out to September 13th. And uh, just looking at these, what longitude does land stop? 15. 15. Okay. And so most of the convection, at least according to trim, most of like the heavy convective rain doesn't occur until you get over water? Yes. Okay. And it's Except for the stuff with five east. Okay. You have, I mean, yeah, according to trim, and while I've got you distracted, most most of the time I hear about a GPCP as a common precip. Yep. Can you use is Seymour close to that, or do you, I mean, do you have a reason not for using GPCP? My reason, well, I wanted to stick with satellite, purely satellite and estimated products. I mean, I've known a GC, GCPC, uh, and I've been meaning to look at it, but since. Uh, my intent is to first use satellite and then compare with station data. I think GCPC is it's more of a conglomeration. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. <coughs> Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So just to interject, I, I actually was just looking at GPCP against CMORF in Florida, and they're pretty similar. So. Okay. This is the trim hub molar. This is the RM3 that you just saw. And then here is the hub muller of what I would call the WARF default physics. Now by default, what I actually mean is when you download the WARF and even th throughout the literature, it's already set up in a mode where it has certain physics already pre-selected. And uh, personal communication with the WARF developers, they prefer that to be just if you don't if you do not toggle with the physics of the warp, just run that. So this is the warp default. And basically, I'll get into the physics in a minute, but if I just take the statistical scores of the hub molar plots, <laughs> meaning the daily accumulated rain for all 12 days. So for instance, if I take a correlation of this hub molar versus this hub molar, what is the score that I get? Basically, RM3 gives great scores. Surprisingly, for instance, here's a correlation of 0.68, it's very significant, whereas the warp default does not. And this <coughs> is, just remember this is a temporal and spatial comparison of rain as it moves throughout the region. So it's not only spatial, but it's also temporal. Same when I compare uh, pub mul or Meridian wind hub molar plots of Mera, RM3, and the Wharf default. Uh, it looks like Wharf, I mean, Wharf definitely gets waves that move across the region, but the reason for the low scores is more related to a timing issue. It's not, it's <laughs> doing waves, but it's not a, you may not be getting it starting at the right time, you may be getting it slower. The tracks. Yeah. The tracks. <coughs> and this is the same 
set up the same type of plots except for vorticity, which shows the tracks of the athenaceous waves. And when I plotted this, I basically keep all the contours on the same, going from negative 10 to 10, and contours of 2. But the wharf just has very high areas of cyclonic activity. These are the scores for measuring, well, when I compare wharf to Mera and RM3 to Mera, basically, the wharf just has lower scores. So I started asking the question, what's up with wharf? What's lagging in wharf? So naturally, or in, I decided to take, so wharf is modular. It has hundreds of, well, not hundreds, but many, many, many physics parameterizations that one can go through. And so I looked through the literature of what other people have used when making simulations in this region. And I chose a very big set and basically went, created a series of simulations going through all these physics. So this table, the first column shows the parameterization function, like the cumulus convection scheme, and the short name, CPS. And these are the two options that I need uh, went through Kane Fritch cumulus scheme, Grell de Venier, and this just shows the abbreviation that I'm going to be using throughout the rest of the talk. KF for Kane Fritch, GD for Grell de Venier. <coughs> Planetary boundary layer, I actually go through four of them. The Yonsei University PBL, Melo Yamada Janjik, the Pline Base Asymmetrical Convective Model, which was actually new in this version of the WARF that I'm using, and this Melo Yamada you know, PDL. And again, more options for each physics parameterization. The land surface model, I basically go through these four. And just go to the bottom. The, the only option that I keep constant is the microphysics, because in several other studies, uh, other people who use warp in this mode use the warp single moment class 5 ensemble scheme for using wharf for grids smaller than 25 kilometers. So I stuck with that. And for the radiation, uh, originally I, I kept, so there are, there are many radiation schemes in wharf, but there are two that are specifically have the word climate model in the title. So for instance, the rapid radiation transfer scheme for climate models, which is called the RRTMG, and then there's also the community atmospheric model at NCAR. Its option is in the middle. So you have the WARF, which basically was developed for short range simulations, but you have these climate model options in them. Naturally, I want to explore uh, WARF's regional climate modeling capability using these options, but so those are the reasons why I chose it. Now, this table just shows. I did 64 experiments by changing each parameter one at a time, and options in the light blue color are kept constant. So this basically, this highlight in red, that's what I would call the warp default, but it's number two in this table because it was easier for me to organize. But basically, if you look at the first row, uh, compared to the second row, the only thing that I changed was the land surface model, and I basically keep to this pattern until the end, and then I start over. I change the PBL, and so on and so on. <coughs> Basically, when I go through the whole, uh, the, all the different configurations, just changing one at a time, I wind up with 64. And I could have had more, but you gotta stop somewhere. So yeah. what I did is I, I simulated, I took all those combinations, right. ran the model for two right. weeks, and took out the variables, precipitation data, the looked at the hub models and compared the scores to each other. And one easy way to look at all the scores all at once versus each score individually is to use a Taylor plot. This is a nice graphical summary that allows you to list correlation, RMSE, uh, variance all in one plot. And these statistics complementary each other to each other. So it allows you to not only just look at how the models score, but also how they compare with each other. <coughs> so basically, this arc shows correlation. 
and the origin shows standard deviation. All models are compared to the reference, which is the Truman reference, in the set of plot. And then if you also notice, I also include the ARM3, the other observation, or the other satellite products, Persian and Seymour. So for instance, when you compare Seymour to Trim, it, it basically has a correlation uh, between, well, about 0.93. But the RMS, these RMSE circles also show how much error is in each of the models as they score against each other. Now this Taylor plot shows the scores for all 12 days, just taking the variables for all 12 days. Any questions on this? This also just shows the same Taylor plot for Trim, but also Wharf versus Seymour. So in this instance, where I showed all models compared to the reference of Trim, along with Seymour from Persian, this Taylor plot shows the same thing with Seymour being a reference model, Trim and Persian being listed, Seymour along with the Wharf models. The point is you reach the same conclusion regardless of which. Right. Right. This is just to show that even when I look at two different uh, products, I'm getting, I get the same conclusion. Now, right away, the, all the wharf models score very low scores, very low uh, correlations, and just it's very obvious that in comparison to the arm, the arm three is much more superior in this context. Chris Ferrari. Um, this is very much based on the spatial pattern, correlation, center deviation, things like that. Spatial and time. Yeah, yeah, sorry. And, and what, what I see when I look at your Huffle diagrams is the propagation speed is different. Mm -hmm. and, and that throws all of this, these metrics into slightly different. I mean, I, I even think just a table of the propagation speed. And a lot, unfortunately, a lot of the dynamic options or the parameterization options won't really change the dynamics of war. I think is probably what's behind a lot of that propagation speed. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if, if you know, I, I feel like often people make the assumption that you know the propagation speed is too fast, but the general behavior is there, um, and whether there's anything like that. Because you know, sticking to these metrics when the propagation speed is wrong, that's why everything the correlation is just so low. Um, that's just what you're saying, I think. Right. So. I, I do realize that. So in my next slide, I actually start. Oh, trying to adjust for yeah. look at adjustment periods, <laughs> yeah. actually. Looking at different days. And uh, that's, yeah, I'll just go ahead and show that. So just to get on that, when I saw those low scores, I, I started asking, OK, well, what else can I look at? So this Taylor plot shows a, another useful thing that I can use the table plot for, of showing a comparison of different scores all on one chart. So basically, the blue area here where the tail of the arrow is, is basically all the scores for the first 24 hours, so just the spatial comparison scores of the first 24 hours of the trim, or compared to, I just chose this WARF simulation, WARF number 59, because it's actually doing really well behavior-wise. So the trim, trim scores for <coughs> comparison between trim and WARF for this first period compared to the same scores for the last, or the same comparison for the last 24 hours. The tail shows the first period, the head shows the last period, and the arrows show the difference, just basically did the scores improve? So I'm looking at the first 24 hours versus the last 24 hours. So they're on the same time variability. Eric, those, those last 24 hour, the wave, for example, in the upper right part of this diagram, right. did that, can you see that wave when you initialize in, East, in, in Eastern Africa, in their domain? Or does that, is that wave created by the model? So it, it's arrived, I can't see, like eight days later? As we initially, you're so talking about 12, 12 days, right? 12 days later, the upper right. This oh, one. Oh, so it's it's east of the prime meridian. Yeah. 12 days later, where was that wave 
was it initialized? Was it off your regional domain? Or yes. Was it? Well, okay, so remember that this thumb holder is, if you remember the diagram, that was in red. My, my actual model yeah, you're, was you're just a portion of it. Yeah. That is, so yes, when you look at the, the painful streamlines, the, uh, you do see this wave as it's, if this is my region, it's, as it's way over here, you yeah. do see it coming. So that is part of the initialization, that, yes. that part. In this instance, I'm using uh, n carbon analysis too. But uh, I'm sure as many of you may know, you can. There are many different boundary conditions you can load in the work. It's set to use all sorts. Of Maybe get back to the other question. I don't. I don't think that way was present on September second. On September second. Yeah, he's asking if it was in the initial data. So what what, what appears on the right hand that on the September 11th, I don't think that it was there on September 2nd. Well, uh, let's see. I guess I'd have to look at the streamlines. That's but it. it just came in, it came in, what, what's the right hand side, 5 East? Yes. So it came past 5 East on September 11th. I doubt if uh, your, your um, right hand side is 35 east, right? It's 35 east. Yeah, I, I don't know. I doubt it. Yeah, you can figure it out. <coughs> I don't think it was there. Yeah. It's just interesting. I, I guess my point is that at some of you are mixing the initial value problem with the internal. And, and I think that's why what you're doing now with this 24 hours. You, even, by the way, even if it was there, it, it, it uh, would be very low amplitude yeah. on the eastern side and it does develop in the domain. So just to remind everybody, so this plot, it basically shows correlation scores. Here are areas of really good correlation. But if you have a model that's actually moving towards, so this is the standard deviation arc of basically all, all, all standard deviations are normalized to the standard deviation of the reference field. And so we, even though you may have some models that don't score really well, they're actually moving, well in this instance when you make this type of comparison, the arrows indicate that they move towards this area in the Taylor plot. It gives some indication that there's an improvement in the model. Or in what you're looking at. So in this instance, so whereas, well, when I looked at the first 24 hours versus the last 24 hours, that was a spatial comparison. But in this, this allows more for a temporal spatial comparison. I'm comparing the first six days versus the last six days. So in a sense, this explores the idea of utilizing a spin-up or an adjustment period in the model. So in this sense, when I compare the scores for the first six days for the wharf experiment 59 versus the trim, which would be at the tail of this arrow, and then the last set, the last six days down at the head, the main point to take away from this plot is it does improve. Now this, this correlation score also improves, not as significantly as the other model, RM3, but there's an improvement. So this means that in future simulations, I just may need to account for a spin up when I'm looking at precipitation. I also looked at, when, when I did these scores, I also looked, just as a note, I also looked at a lag, for instance, starting a comparison of uh, the wharf to trim offsetting by a day, and offsetting by a day ahead and a day behind, and it didn't really make a difference in the scores correlation. So if I take the best scores in this instance for the 12-day period or and also the six-day adjustment period, these tables show my top five, and they're arranged according, actually, let me show that real quick. Uh, for instance, if you see 59, 60, 45, 34, you guys aren't going to remember that when you leave. <laughs> but uh, not only, I don't, I don't plot on the table according to just correlation. I also list, I arrange it in order of centered RMSE error, because that also basically gave me an indication of uh, just not only the top models in this sense, but in some sense, the highest scoring models are the ones that gave the least error. For instance, the top two also have 
the same set of physics, except the only thing separating them, the only difference is the radiation physics. So that's something. Is this for preset? This is for preset. Yes. And these scores basically show that when I use a 60 day adjustment period, there's an improvement. For instance, not only in the correlation, but also less error. But in the end, just comparison to RM3, uh, RM3 is superior in this sense, in this context. I do the same thing with uh, looking at tail plots for Meridiana Wind in comparison to Wharf to Mera and Wharf to Mera for deep vorticity. And in this sense, these are the comparisons for all 12 days. I get better scores. It's circulation. And for instance, some of the models, when I take the scores over the entire 12 day period, are getting very significant scores, at least 0.6. Uh, RM3 is down here, less amplitude. These Taylor plots, you can't see it really well, but this shows NNRP mirror reference point. And so basically, when I take all 12, whereas in, when I looked at precipitation, I took all 12 days, I was getting low scores. When I look at circulation, I'm getting some significant scores. So that gives me some confidence that the model has skill, at least in terms of circulation. These two plots, basically, this top plot shows, I'm only looking at vorticity now, since that uh, gives a measure of circulation that moves through the region. Uh, this Taylor plot shows the scores from day one to six and from day seven to 12. So the first six days versus the last six days. And it shows that during the first six days, the models all pretty much behave in the same manner, get a significant score. Here's the RM3. But as they basically deteriorate as time goes on. So where when I actually did this comparison, I had arrows moving basically in a positive direction, most of the arrows move in a negative direction. So in the end, an adjustment period doesn't help. Doesn't help the circulation. Right. And in, in some sense, the model's behaving exactly as we would expect uh, a forecast model. The circulation, a variable like circulation would deteriorate with time. Here again are my top experiments, just looking in this context, and it turns out they are the same experiments uh, that I noticed in when I was looking at the precipitation variable. And again, note that the top two experiments share the same physics except for radiation. So basically, this is, I had to start somewhere with trying to vet the model to this region. And in, in one sense, I just took a two week time period, which is not exhaustive, but it provides some insight to whether or not this model has skill for this region. And um, <coughs> just in this context, I would say that the warp model has difficulty with simulating precipitation and perhaps that they could be improved with an adjustment. And that warp simulates circulation well in the beginning but deteriorates with time, expected of a forecast model. And one might expect that if the model lets circulation variables deteriorate, it will not get rainfall in the right place and miss it altogether. Uh, this is just streamlined comparison of WARF versus uh, Merit. It's basically shown that waves, this is at the last three days, the low that turned into a hurricane. Just that WARF does catch the waves, it's just not in the same, well, it's partly in the same spot. Actually, that's a very painful slide. And my next steps are basically to take the top six experiments, start six days earlier, just to see if there's, an, to look for an adjustment period. Start 15 days earlier, which is the entire one month on my period. And then, of course, my next work will be taking the, the work in the seasonal simulations. Oh yeah. And also, as of last Thursday, finally, I got some, the French gave me some station data after a lot of asking. And uh, it's from the AMA study, even though it was an international collaborative effort, getting data was a bit hard. So now my, I intend to finally, uh, so I have station data, so do our precipitation, 
for instance, precipitation, just make comparisons. For instance, like Len did in his paper, where this shows uh, arm three versus rain gauges versus trim for uh, 34 daily rain gauges averaged over an area. And it shows, let's see, that uh, trim is in green. Rain gauge observations are in blue and the RM3 is in red. And basically shows that during this three month time period that the model got the peaks in the right place and that trim matches the station data pretty well. And so allow me to do a comparison with not only the model versus the satellites, but also station data themselves. Thing is uh, representative uh, to uh, to uh, predict those um, uh, statistics with a short term period. I mean, you're comparing it's true that you're comparing a lot of different setups, mm -hmm. but that's just kind of you know a ten day period, twelve day period. Right. So, uh, do you think that this would hold if you uh, if you analyze a larger amount of, of, of cases? You mean so it would keep the same uh, longer time scale. Yeah, no, yeah, longer time scale, but you know, over over a whole season uh, with different kind of um, um, not only one small period of time. Possibly, because I will be. You know, you have a pattern, but of course, I mean, uh, patterns change, and you know, so when when um, in forecasting applications, not not for you know, climate, I mean, when different models are compared, they are compared for many different cases, not only one case. Mm -hmm. And so basing, uh, so if one model is very good for one case, it can be very bad also for another case. So my question is, to what point you can you can believe uh, these results uh, uh, to to generalize these results to to um, to all typical cases during the wet season? I understand. Uh, well, my first answer to that is I had to start somewhere. Yeah. With these uh, going through all these simulations, I started with the warp default. Uh, there, I mean it's, it's in the literature, for instance, there are studies that analyze the West African monsoon over September 2006, entire summer period, and longer simulations where they take just three configurations of the wharf and look at just basically, just look at which one of those do the best and plot the results. But there hasn't been an extensive sensitivity analysis of just going through all the physics and it, it'd be impossible to, well it wouldn't be impossible, but it'd take a lot of time to do that, let's say over a 10 year period or just the entire summer 2006 period even at this resolution. So I wouldn't say that the results that I get over a two week time period are in a whole or a longer time scale, but I would say that I'm going to take the top six here just go from there to see, for instance, uh, yeah, just, just start doing seasonal simulations. Taking the time mean might overcome the problem with the phase speed of the systems, right? Might, but even, uh, even for that, uh, there's a big spread among the different, uh, different versions. So, uh, there's a big sensitivity to the different parameterizations. This one is looking at the daily and the phase speeds of the systems, and uh, time means might show different results. Mm -hmm. But even just, you know, that, that led to hurricane in Italy. Yes. Yeah, so like it would be interesting to go and take another hurricane uh, and the 12 day period before that one mm -hmm. and see if the calibration that you did to this situation matches or how, how the gets to the next story. At least for a few cases, not all the not all the So I mentioned that I'll do fifteen days prior to this period. There was also another tropical storm that moved off the region. Or afternoon slip way that moved off the region.
formation that didn't form a tropical cyclone. There's also several Aphenesley waves that didn't form a tropical cyclone. So in one sense, I'm looking at Aphenesley waves. Uh, I, I mean, I chose this period not because it's a two-week time period, but also because there were several Aphenesley waves that occurred within that time period. So it wasn't just one, it was four. So, yeah, stretching, stretching the time longer will allow me to look at more cases. But, you know, it depends what I'm going for. In this case, I'm looking at Aphenesley waves. So, definitely. Yes. Um, <coughs> so these these configurations that sort of one, mm -hmm. do they make sense? Is it um, are these um, sort of adjusted for these conditions, or is it just yeah, it's kind of random? It's not random. I mean, I, I started with the literature, but most regional climate models I've come across are run at half degree scale. I ran this at twenty kilometer degree scale, and the reason for that is. Well, uh, most of the parameters that I used, that I saw in the literature, were tuned were, were tuned basically for the model being run at a very high resolution. Um, this setup, this domain, the domain that I used, no, I mean, it's, it's known that if you use different domain, different sizes of domain, that can affect model output. Different boundary conditions. I'm using reanalysis too. Mm -hmm. I could use a different reanalysis. Well, uh, I, I mean, I, I guess there are compaction schemes or so that are oh. sort of um, um, developed to get the compaction in this region right. So maybe they also kind of win if you dose if, if you put those in the configuration. Both of these have been used in West Africa, right? Both yes, both these convection schemes have been used in West Africa. There is a convection scheme that's actually meant for shorter for, uh, simulations on shorter scales, like six hours. It's called the Best Miller. It's also been shown to do well in this region, but for a different mode, for instance, looking at a three-day forecast. But my, uh, the point is that the wharf was a model that it, it's tuned for North America. So in this sense, even though I'm using it over West Africa, it's not tuned to West Africa. It's, I mean, there's so much development that's gone into this model that's now available for everyone to use, but it's still tuned to North America. So that's another thing that I'm, I'm dealing with. So yeah. And also, the schemes that are in WARP, some of they're put in there by different developers almost as competition rather than mm -hmm. for specific regimes. Oh, yeah. So okay. Yeah. How, do you, yeah. how do you know which ones are like that? You, you, have to, you have to do this. So <laughs> you have to go through yourself to figure out? <laughs> well, so given the number of model parameters in each of these schemes, it's, it's yeah. ridiculous. Well, the, I mean, the, when somebody adds a scheme to work, they, you know, they'll publish a paper on why they added it. Right. So then you can go to that paper and at least get a sense of what they feel they gained with that new scheme. Right. So right. that's what you have to do. You have to dig through the literature. Yep. Yeah. And then you, you have all of these different possibilities of physics. And as you say, you have to go to the literature to figure out which ones are probably appropriate for this region. But then you said this model's not even built for this region. So then, but hold on, that hold on. seems the, really the, the model. It's the model for solves it. the primitive equations. Yeah. So, <laughs> but pretty poorly. <laughs> it, it relies on physics. <laughs> <laughs> but it looks and pretty bad. But the, but a lot and of that is related to you know you bringing in um, you know you're just solving for a small area, so you right. have to bring in data and kind of rely well, on what data you have coming in. The other question I have is you you're picking. Uh, if I understood it correctly, maybe I didn't get it right, but it looked like you're fixing many of the schemes, then changing one, then fixing the other, then changing. Right. I think that's probably not the, maybe not the ideal way to do it. You should really be doing like a, a proper mixture model that randomly samples the parameter space and then does a bunch of runs and sees what it does. Because this is like looking for a needle in a haystack, and you're better off changing several of them at, at once and then seeing what you get out in a sense. But well, what you, what? Yeah. well, you could at least take. Well, you can see what you put in. You know what physics you put. I'm saying you change the physics, which physics you put in. Yeah. You do it in a in a um, optimized fashion. This is just running everything. But the, this, right. what do you say, will work if you have a proper parameter space, not the physics uh, formulation space. Mm -hmm. So you cannot pick 
one against the other or sample a range of physics parameterizations. It's not a parameter that is uncertainly and you can vary it. It's just really completely different physics. Well, and also the there is no way to compare the. No, no I mean, I'm not saying you should take them all. I'm saying he has a range here. But yeah, but change it. Basically. In this case, you could you can narrow down which ones he should change. Like you he can't. can take his results right now and say which is it more sensitive to. Like. When you it, what is there a larger spread across changes in your cumulus scheme or changes in your land surface scheme? Yes, that right. makes sense. So right, so the function of the different options, for instance, yeah, I had two options for cumulus. I I could do that analysis with just looking at the functions of the physics, but all the different options it would be. Well, I mean, which is it? Can't we can just start to get rid of some? Can we? Like, <laughs> I mean, like, if you go back a couple uh, pages here, and then in one of them, I remember the Taylor diagram had, it looked like, uh, <coughs> clusters. Yeah, clusters. Yeah, yeah. Are you talking about this, this one? Well, let's use this one, okay. So the bottom left-hand panel one, looks like you have a cluster around correlation of, you know, 0 0.1, uh, and one around 0.4. <laughs> yeah, let me get a <laughs> I, even though these are small, okay. Well, let's just say, let's say you took all those dots and you plotted the grow in red and the cane fridge in blue. Would you yeah. see them sort themselves out? Oh, you, you, did, you did mention it, yeah, but the cane versus the uh, RT. Oh, well, the first 32 were all RT and the second 32 were all can. Yes, radiation. so in the 64 and table, that, that seems to make a difference, right? Right, one, so, good example. One difference I already noticed off the bat is basically all the scores that are, all the model versions that are doing better are using the CAM filters. So I could throw away. It's the radiation package. Right, it's the radiation package. I could throw away the first radiation option. That would be fine. But that's pretty significant to me because in the literature, most people that have used WARF for this region use the first radiation package. Right, and another way to interpret that instead is to say, well, it's more sensitive to that. So I, I, you might want to keep that one in there for testing, but not really worry too much about the ones it's less sensitive to, right? If you're just getting really small little jumps around and you're changing some physics parameter, then that physics parameter is not affecting your result that much. Right. Or even just to take the correlation, you know, you have a bunch of statistics that if you, if you took all of the setups that had CAM physics versus other radiation schemes, and just at the average of all of those correlations, mm -hmm. you know, if, if the difference between your selections is nothing, then that's probably not a sensitive, you know, variable. But then I also would encourage you to find another metric. I think if you can, if you can actually calculate the propagation speed and see if any of your parameters are, are affecting that, uh, that would be quite interesting. I can understand actually why radiation could do that. So I think if you find something that is a potential knob on propagation speed, that strikes me as being uh, important there. Okay. Alex, do you have any ideas why most models are uh, overestimating the standard deviation so they can calculate a much higher variability? Which work parameter might affect that? That I don't know about. Uh, I mean, in rainfall, certainly the convective parameterization would be. Which means that all the, the the ones tested here all overestimate the variability. So, but you could get increased variability just by changing your, your propagation speed, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So all you have to do is speed everything up, and then it appears as if it's a stronger, higher variability. I mean, the other the other thing that might come into play there is the resolution. Um, so if you're using trim, yeah. it's quarter degree resolution. It's small, but you know, uh, having a finer grid point, you would expect slightly higher variability. Have you considered testing um, the other dynamical core of the work? Yes. The NMM? Yes, I have. Um, in fact, I, I ran one. With the operational physics options of, of the NMM, use that NSAT. Yes. Which a priori are super tuned for precipitation. Yes. In North and America, but. Uh, and if I understand correctly, it's frozen, right? It's a frozen model. No, it's the, it's the operational North American model. Okay, well, so there's, a, so there's also another work with another core, which is what they call the North American model. And I, 
yes, that was a goal, but I can't, you know, basically the more involved I got with looking at these, the more I could edit so it, It's more a general question because in this case, so, I mean, there, there, there have been, I mean, uh, we talked about this, but I think we, we can discuss a little bit. There have been two main, within the work of our, uh, in the beginning it was supposed to be a model, but it's, it's more an infrastructure than a model because it contains a lot of physics options, but also it contains two different dynamical cores. Right. One from NCAR and the other one from NCEP, which are based on, on different philosophies. The one from NCEP comes more from, uh, uh, so it comes from the early ethanol, which is, was based more on dynamics, more than in the physics, and, and the people from, from NCAR uh, started with cumulus models based on physics and then extended to more dynamics, right? So they, they come from different philosophies, and really dynamical core is different. And also the philosophy of operations makes, uh, uh, operations versus research makes uh, the philosophy of the model a bit different. In the case of NSEP, for example, they, they, don't, they, don't use, they don't like to use many different schemes and test them, but they, they rather work on, on a set of schemes which, and they, they, uh, they try to improve the interaction among the schemes. So the, the cumulus scheme is tuned uh, together with the uh, uh, grid scale uh, precipitation scheme. And uh, the radiation is tuned with this specific soil model. So they, they, they have spent a lot of time tuning the whole model so things make sense one to each other, not testing different parameterizations in which you don't know where the errors come from in the end. Okay, you can have better or worse scores. So the question is, um, so would it be possible to test this, this setup because sure. it's included in the war in the war uh, oh. infrastructure. Yes. Are they using it as a regional climate model? Are they using it in that mode? Yeah, some people are using it not at NSEP, but some people are using it in yeah. regional climate models. So, I mean, that is my overall goal here, is that I'm trying to use the warp as a regional climate model. Mm -hmm. And this is the research version, so naturally I just went with this one. Mm -hmm. I have known about that one, and my first reaction to it was, okay, this is an operational model used definitely to for forecasts, and I'd like to explore this model first you before you I made a, You made a run with it, but you, I mean, you didn't look at the uh, answers. Right. Yeah. I mean, part of that's because I had already had this huge selection to start looking for, but uh, the other half is I still need to get familiar with that output. <laughs> yeah, well, you will get more runs the way, because just one point, uh, even if it's outside the cloud, mm -hmm. you, you will not know where it is. And also, I had some experience with reanalysis too. You use uh, also solid moisture uh, initial conditions from reanalysis too to initialize the model, right? Right. Because I had problems with that when I was doing my simulations. Okay. So um, the, the soil moisture was highly biased in Northern Africa. Okay. Did the effects of the soil very Huh? Did the effects of the soil very similar? Did the soil moisture affect the soil very similar? Thanks for coming. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah.